Hi, I'm Andrew Rodriguez, and welcome to Psycho Bible, babbling about psychology and theology. A couple weeks ago, on Monday, April 20th, 2020, the world lost a hero, and heaven welcomed home a servant. Cy Rogers, a former gay, former transgender identified person, but a real man who became an international speaker, pastoral counselor, and even recording artist. His personal story is quite powerful. Uh, if you can find a copy of the DVD, One of the Boys, he tells his testimony more in depth. But you can find videos of him online, teaching and preaching, sharing his story. He has a real wit and fire when he speaks. Uh, here's a clip of him sharing his story from a 2013 women's conference. Now, some of you have heard a little bit about my story as a professional football player, and more about that in a minute. But... They always laugh, Lord. Nevertheless, you know, the nature of my work, I've been addressing sexual themes for years. And I've learned that underneath what people do are reasons why. And it's not about sex, but it is about the way we connect to God and everybody else. And therefore, anything that interferes with that is of great importance to God. Our whole faith is built on how we connect to God and other people. And so many times I hear from people They'll say, it's really not the sex I want, you know. I just want someone to put their arms around me and for 10 minutes make me feel like I'm valuable. That's not evil, it's human. And so in my experience, you know, I don't think I know it all or that I've arrived in my years of serving the Lord and walking it out and, and certainly in pastoral care, I've learned a lot in my journey of serving others. But the best lessons come out of my life. And if you're not familiar with that first foundation, let's go ahead and cover some of that because I like to say to people, why am I not a Buddhist? And why am I not a Marxist? And why would I give up my boyfriend? Why would I give up my gay friends? Why would I crucify my flesh daily? And why would I swim against the tide of popular culture telling me I'm politically incorrect and insensitive? And why would I walk into church culture that would look at me like a freak from Mars? There's only one answer. My eyes were open to God three decades ago, and he ceased to be some code of ethics to debate or some philosophical point of view or some, some uh, other religious option on the big religious buffet. He became a real live experience and person to me, and I could not touch him tangibly, but I could not deny his tangible effect upon my life and so I began my journey but just to help you understand some of my journey so that when I'm up here talking you will understand that I do understand what it's like to go off track and to have to learn what it's like to get back on track and for me the miracle isn't that I got saved three decades ago it's that I've walked on with God for three decades which is no small achievement considering my history my humanity and its vulnerabilities and so there are reasons why, and that's why, you know, Pastors Brian and Bobby had me come last year to, to share insight in the Sense and Sexuality Conference so that people could understand the tools that have made a difference, and we're going to take a look at one more page from my journal in this session today. So if you don't know my story, let's go ahead and put the first image up there. I'll walk you through it quickly. I come from a broken home. A lot of people do. It didn't make me gay. It made me unnurtured and insecure. And my mother was more than an alcoholic. She was a very brilliant student and a part-time model. She had a lot going on for her, but alcoholism eclipsed her, and she died in a drunk driving accident at the age of 28. But before her death, she had an affair with a man who began sexually violating me as a child, teaching me things God never wanted me to know. My mother, you know, she died, and I was separated from my father after my mother's death. Here, my dad sent me away with the purest motives, folks. He intended to bless me by putting me in a more stable home than he felt that he could afford to offer me after my mom's death. And you know what? It doesn't matter what he intended. It's how you perceive it and react that becomes your reality. So he sent me away with good motive. I perceived abandonment. You know, my problem wasn't that I didn't like girls. I could understand masculine attraction to the feminine. I could never bother getting to girls yet because I never knew how to connect to my own gender. Men either abused me or abandoned me. That was my experience up to the point. And it got only worse as I grew up in the American Midwest on the buckle of the Bible Belt. I used to say the stork was on his way to Los Angeles and I fell out over the Midwest. It's not that Midwestern Americans aren't some nice people, but they did expect a certain conformity to the norm. And because I wasn't masculine enough, I became an object of mistreatment. So you don't have to be a rocket scientist to understand that by the time I was a young adult, well, 
I was convinced I was gay. That's what everybody else said. And though I was on swim team and football team and track team, and I was an Eagle Scout, and I went hiking in the Rocky Mountains, I had two motorcycles, and I could do anything any boy could do, it didn't heal me of my damage, cleanse me from my defilement, or convince me I was a man among the men. I hungered for masculine love. I embraced a gay identity as an exchange student in Brazil. I came back to America and promptly joined the Navy and did what a lot of people do. I lived a double life. I even went to everything from the gay bar scene to later involvement in a gay church, and I was the best man at a gay wedding in the state of Hawaii. And interestingly, that couple who went to a gay church, and they were gay, but they did love God, they read the Word, and they one day wrote to me about a year after their marriage. I was in university, and they said, Sai, we suggest you do what we've done. You start reading the Bible for yourself because we feel convicted and convinced that the way we are living is not God's best for us. And therefore, you can surround yourself with others who'll tell you what you want to hear, but there's really only one opinion that matters. And why don't you use the good brain God gave you and do your own research because God promises to lead you in truth if you care what he thinks on these matters. They said they were now born again and praying for me, and I thought they were crazy. And my way to be born again, I said, is to throw away my failed masculinity since it had only brought me shame in a sense of inadequacy. I'll tell you what, ladies, I know that maybe your history isn't like mine and we've got the gender difference, but at the same time, I can tell you, there are a lot of people, men or women, they do not feel good in their skin because they've been robbed through circumstance. And I want you to know there's a God who has better for you. That's right. More on that later. But that said, that was me living as a woman in preparation for a sex change, which I thought was my answer. You can relax, I did not have that operation. <laughs> but I did live as a woman for almost two years, and that is the point when God intervened and opened my eyes to his reality. Just when people would think I'm too far gone, too far out, too far over the edge, that's when God intervened. And he did not say, stop being gay. He said, stop resisting me. What this video doesn't tell you is that he was actually on the waiting list for a sex change operation at Johns Hopkins University. And one day, he began seeking God and asked him for a sign. Three days later, he got a call from Johns Hopkins telling him that they're closing down their transsexual procedure department. They did the research and found that post-operative transsexuals were no better adjusted, no happier, no better off than preoperative. And there was even some evidence of being worse off. So, it, right there, it, this quest for becoming a woman to validate uh, his fem femininity because he had rejected his masculinity ended. So God spoke to him right there. Around that time, he walked into a church, and the pastor had a prophetic word for him, showing him God's heart for him. It's like he read his mail, and he surrendered his life to God and began attending that church. God ceased to be an idea and became real. And in spite of all I didn't know, this much I did know, for some reason I mattered to him. And while it's nice you can seek him and find him, I'm so grateful he goes looking for lost sheep who don't know enough to go looking for him. So he didn't wave the magic wand, one, two, three, now you're free, go be straight, date, and mate. Bing! Thank you so much. He did not turn me into the heterosexual stallion you see before you today, overnight, you know. Took time, took push-ups, but nevertheless, God began to bring cleansing to defilement. He began to bring healing to damage, and he began to dress himself up in the skin of his people, especially men in church who began to love me, hug me, touch me, include me in their lives. Men who were not ashamed to be seen across the table in public from me, knowing they might be judged by virtue of association, and they were big enough and secure enough to do it for my benefit. Men who showed me as they took me to the men's camp and the men's Bible study and the men's breakfast that I don't have to be sexual with men to get what I've always wanted from them, which was not sex. It was love, affection, identification, and acceptance. My hunger was satisfied the right way, says Psalm 107. And so, folks, as I began to grow beyond my fixation on men, that's when I discovered girls. It's a terrible thing to go through puberty twice, may I tell you. And if you would put up the happier images there for me, today, as you know, I enjoy being married for 27 years. And while that doesn't prove I'm not gay, we all know people can live double lives, it is evidence of a life I never imagined. What was once undesirable and unattainable became both. 
So I'm not in the ministry to gay people. I'm in the ministry to people. And I'm not in the ministry of changing people's orientation. I don't have that power. I am in a pastoral care ministry of encouraging people to surrender to God and walk on with Him. That he's the God with the history of sexual redemption. Rahab and Samson, King David, Mary Magdalene, the adulteress, the woman at the well, and the New Testament church in Corinth. God knows how to save people from their sins, cleanse them, and adopt them into the family of faith, and put them to work for his name. And he does it still today. Cy so married his wife Karen in 1982. He later became a dad and then a grandfather. And Cy so ministered for nearly 40 years in the field of sexual brokenness. In the early 80s, he joined Exodus, the former coalition of ministries to, to people leaving homosexuality, and he helped it go international. He's probably the one who made it international. He started ministries in Singapore and New Zealand. He did some ministry in Australia and just other places around the globe. He made edgy Christian techno music. Uh, in the later years, he was a bit more measured in his approach. He operated much more independently, uh, going where doors would open. But in his early days, he was such a spitfire and willing to take some blows. He knew he didn't look like he had changed in his orientation and on the surface. And he knew he didn't look masculine or stereotypically masculine. He would even admit that in moments of weakness, his old temptations could trigger. But he would never let anyone get away with denying the change he's experienced. And he boldly proclaimed that change is possible for those who wanted it. Just check out this clip from him on Sally Jesse Raphael in the early days. You still have a very feminine aspect. Well, I'll tell you what, I'm light years from pantyhose, lady. I'm, I may not be a... I, I, may, I may never... I may never ever be a Burt Reynolds look-alike, but I don't believe that I have to be to enjoy being a man and a happy heterosexual at that. I understand that you're saying that you help uh, homosexual men now yes. be go going straight. Let a lot of people would argue with that and say that there's nothing wrong with being homosexual. Everybody is different. Let me explain this. Are, now, you, are you saying that homosexual men need fixing or are me, you saying that let, some homosexual men need fixing? Let me explain. We have a, I am vice president of a worldwide network of agencies which help people overcome homosexuality. For over 12 years, our offices in Europe, North America, the South Pacific and Caribbean have helped people who have come to us. Quite frankly, those of you who are adults, your sex life is your business. Unless, no, they come to us and I'll tell you what, all of our 60 agencies have a booming business because not everybody who is gay wants to be. And I get mail from over 40 countries and for every one person who writes me, and wait a minute, wait a minute, for every one person who writes me and says, I like being gay, I hear from probably 10 more who say, I wish to God I could be anything but a homosexual. Marriage doesn't prove I'm not gay, but let me answer this. Um, I became a Christian, which is how I changed. I became a Christian. Um, and the Bible even has biblical evidence of, well, let me explain. There is a lot of clinical evidence which says, there's clinical evidence which says homosexuals can change, but there's 2,000-year-old New Testament biblical evidence that says God's power had changed homosexuals, and so the New Testament church in the city of Corinth 2,000 years ago in the Bible was populated by ex-homosexuals. Understand, Sally, we cannot change anybody. If people want to stay gay and be gay, that is their business. Okay. We don't argue that. But for people who don't want to be gay and make their sex life our business, then we are there to offer them support and encouragement to change. So we're not beating people over the head with the Bible and telling them anything. I is there any way you can prove what you're saying today? Is there any way you can disprove it? We have... We have <laughs> oh. what, I'm, what I'm saying is, it's very easy to say, well, this isn't true, and people can't change. How can I have a videotape to know you're not a homosexual if you say I'm happily married and heterosexual? How can I know what goes on in your mind and in your life behind, you know, behind closed doors? Now, I think this is the argument we get. If you're gay, you can't change, and if you change, you were never really gay. Well, that's ludicrous to the people that come to our agencies. And there are no studies that prove that people are born gay. You may have read studies and perceived them or misinterpreted, but there's nothing that says people are born gay on the records. If there were, I would be confronted with it, and nobody from the pro-gay community has been able to say, this is so. Man, that boldness. It might make some of us cringe now, but that was needed at the time. He was at the peak of his healing. Uh, so the level of his confidence makes sense to me. Sure, we also need some voices to, to temper expectations, uh, but we also need people willing to cry out in the streets and proclaim the goodness of God in their lives and to offer hope to people. And we, we're, it, it bothers me so much, some of the movements going on now in the church, like in Revoice, where they, don't, they totally 
deny the possibility of healing. And so they just say, well, we got to adhere to the traditional sexual ethic. Well, what you're going to end up with is a bunch of dis, uh, disillusioned people uh, who are now accepting a gay identity. They're going to eventually go into it. That's not offering them any real hope. All that said, I consider myself extremely blessed to have met Sai and his wife Karen eight years ago. Like, literally, about eight years ago, because it was in May 2012. So, although it was just the one time, Sai played a bit of a role in my own story. When I was studying psychology at Valley Forge Christian College, I had interned at Day 7 Ministries, a former member ministry of Exodus, and where I now work. At Day 7, Sai's name came up as one of the big names in the field, but he didn't have a book written and YouTube really didn't exist yet at the time, so you could mostly only hear him speak in person or watch his DVDs that he sold on his website. So I had heard of Sai, but I really wasn't exposed to him very much. Now jump ahead to 2011. My wife and I just began attending New Covenant Church in Trap, PA. Uh, later we re it was renamed True North Christian Church. And Pastor Bob and Margaret invited us out to dinner with them uh, to meet us. And I shared my story of starting up a group at my college for guys who had been through abuse, who were dealing with sexual addiction and pornography addiction, and who were coping with unwanted same-sex attraction. And fortunately, when he heard that group that I was leading, Pastor Bob got really excited. And he's like, guess what? I know Cy Rogers. I used to go to the same church as him in Florida. So in May 2012, Pastor Bob arranged for Cy and his wife Karen to come up to our small little church in Pennsylvania to do a two-day workshop on sexual brokenness. I believe this was Cy's final speaking engagement in the U.S. before moving back to New Zealand as well. I was able to bring one of the guys from my group to the, all the sessions, and he loved it. Like He would say that Sai was one of the best speakers he ever heard, and I would agree. He is, he is dynamic, even though Sai would admit it himself that he still would get nervous, even after 30-something years of, of speaking, and he would plan out meticulously what he would say. But it worked. He was very dynamic, very witty, very powerful. And my wife Jessica and I had the privilege, the immense honor, of going out for breakfast with Sai and Karen, just the four of us. It was like my pastor's gift to me. And we could have just kept talking for hours. Uh, they were such an encouragement to me. And they even blessed me with a bunch of his DVDs, uh, which I then began using in my group. I had already been running that group for like four years, and so for the next uh, several years of running that group, I would use his DVDs. Uh, for some of our sessions. Interestingly, Sai warned me of dark days coming. California had just passed the first ever SOCI therapy ban, uh, SOCI sexual orientation change efforts, or what uh, propagandists like to also call conversion therapy, but really it's just counseling for people with unwanted same-sex attraction and gender confusion. Well, California was the first state to pass a ban for minors. And Sai urged me to consider leaving the U.S. and taking my ministry to other countries that are more open to our message. And I had to consider his words, but I was like, no, I think God still wants me to stay here and stick it out, at least for now. It was kind of prophetic. At the time, I was just starting graduate school at Chestnut Hill College for counseling. After about six years of lay counseling at night while working full-time at an office job, I finally had taken the plunge so I can pursue my passion and uh, dive into ministry full-time as a counselor. And while we were doing this particular seminar, I had just started doing my techniques of counseling class with Professor Claudia Garcia Leeds. And we were required to keep a journal and submit it at the end of the semester. And so I journaled about meeting Sai and about the seminar, my experience, and the work I was doing with guys leaving homosexuality. And the note I got back on my journal from my professor on the last day of that class was, and I quote, Have you thought of how your values regarding homosexuality might play a role in the way you counsel your clients, particularly those that are struggling with the coming out process? Now that was after class ended, so I didn't get to answer her. 
But what I would have said was, and have you considered how your bias would affect clients who do not wish to adopt a gay identity or engage in homosexual relationships and behaviors? Simple solution, there should be counselors available for either option. Anyway, this is significant because three years later, when I was just four weeks away from finishing my internship and then graduating, and the heads of the graduate program told me to stop my internship because they learned I had ex experienced working with men leaving homosexual lifestyles and coping with unwanted same-sex attraction, they tried to pretend that they never knew I was involved in this work. But this same professor, Garcia Leeds, from early in my program, who read about me meeting Cy Rogers, was now on the faculty board that had replaced the former program director. So she was part of the very committee that made the decision to end my internship and kick me out of the school. So the claim that they had no idea of my work in this field was a blatant lie. And that's only one of the evidences because there's another professor or a few that knew and were in power. But it's all good. God took that discrimination I experienced at Chestnut Hill and propelled me even more into this field. I consider it an honor to have traded some blows for client rights and the kingdom of God. There are a lot of things I said at the seminar that will stay with me forever. And you, there are a lot of things that he said there that he has also said in other talks. But there's, there's one part that I felt was pretty unique, and I don't think I've seen him say it other places. And it always stuck with me. It was near the end of the whole seminar. And it's very poignant for today as well. It was a section that he called Understand the Age You Live In. He was referencing a book called The Fourth Turning. It's about the cyclical nature of time in societies. You see, in history, we see 80-year cycles. So these researchers, had, these historians, had noticed this trend of 80-year cycles. About, um, and it's broken down into four uh, seasons that are about mm, roughly 20 years each season. So you have spring, and that's the season of being high on optimism, and things are looking good, and, and we're developing and growing as a society. Then there's summer. That's the awakening. That's where you start questioning the norms that we took for granted, and uh, some of the, uh, the beliefs that maybe didn't have enough basis from the previous generation. And then there's autumn. That's the, this time of unraveling and reveling in rebelliousness and the un unraveling of norms. And then there's winter, the time of crisis. He explained that in America, our springtime high began after World War II. There were new opportunities coming. There was a trust in government and community uh, in our pro and the potential of our prosperity. And there, it was a time of Christian conservatism that we shared values. But then... 60s and 70s, you had the, the civil rights movement, the hippie movement, uh, the sexual revolution, and it's a time of upheaval and questioning the values that we had taken for granted, and some rightly so. There's a lot of things that got brushed under the rug in previous generations. And so some of the revolution is necessary. But then comes the 80s and 90s, and that's the fall, the autumn, the time of of re celebrating rebellion, the culture wars. And he mentioned that in 1997 there was a prediction that a major crisis would soon occur. We're coming near the end of the autumn season, so soon it would be winter, the time of crisis. And what happened? 9-11, 2001. And anyone who was more of an adult in that time can tell can testify how much our society went into a dark phase. And we're still in it in some ways. And what's interesting is that in more recent years, due to globalism, we're internationally synchronized for the first time in history since the Tower of Babel. We have generational destiny. And he pointed out that in times of crisis, fascism rises. And we are certainly seeing that in our day, whether we're talking about the anti-therapy bans that are sweeping the country and all these uh, rights being taken away from parents and from adults who want to resolve their unwanted same-sex attractions or gender confusion. Um, 
to just now with the the response to the COVID-19 pandemic. And he gave a very interesting insight. In Mandarin, the word crisis means risk and opportunity. So there's every crisis is a crossroads. It's an opportunity that will involve risk. And so this is something that always stuck with me and I always explain this to my clients ever since then. And so he gave a word of encouragement. Even though times may seem dark, he said, be not afraid in the crisis, but be informed. Pray intentionally. Be prepared so that you can be empowered. And he pointed out that for so long the church has been divided, but unity in the church may now come about because of something bigger, something larger. And I think that that trouble is the barrage against God's plan for our sexuality, which is the image of God stamped upon us. And so I also mentioned this, that it coincides with my, what I just said there. And he says that in times of crisis, humans are wired irrationally to reproduce. You would think that you want to hunker down, but no, it, it's not safe to have kids. But no, we, we are wired that in times of crisis to actually procreate. And he says it's true physically and spiritually. When there's trial, there's revival. And when Sai taught this part of the seminar, I saw it as downright prophetic, and it sure was. So now we are eight years later from that seminar. Uh, I regret never getting a photo with Sai and Karen, and I regret not reaching out to Sai later on to give him an update on my graduate school and what happened. Uh, I didn't want to be presumptuous that we now had a special connection after one meeting, and sometime after he visited our church, we learned he was battling cancer, and he overcame it. But then, just about a month ago, we learned that the cancer returned. We lost a hero in this field, but I'm happy to see a new generation coming up, a new generation of rainbow crossers, former LGBT, ex-gays, once-gays, post-gays, whatever they want to call themselves, people pushing through their same-sex attraction and gender confusion and pursuing wholeness and integrity and identity from their father. There won't be another Cy Rogers. He, he's, he was one of a kind. Okay, But bold men and women are rising up. We see them in the change movement and in the Freedom March, at Restored Hope Network, at Voice of the Voiceless. And so we are the fruit of the pioneers like Cy, that old guard who came into the 80s on fire and proclaimed a message of freedom to the captives. So well done, Cy good and faithful servant.